Okay, let us begin with our lecture today, Quantum Field Theory 2. We are in the middle of quantizing and discussing the quantized Young-Mills theories. And uh, last time we started by, uh, with looking at higher orders and renormalization. And we already wrote down the so-called renormalization transformation, which is a recipe that gives you a certain counterterm structure which hopefully is able to cancel all the divergencies which appear in co the course of the calculations. Um, but we have not yet established that they do, but in order to establish it, the next tool that we need are the slavnov taylor identities. So let us now uh, discuss slavnov taylor identities. The slavnov taylor identities are nothing but the expression of BRST invariance on the level of green functions. You know that after gauge fixing and adding ghosts, the Lagrangian has a new symmetry, BRST symmetry. And uh, this symmetry on the Lagrangian level is reflected by certain relationships between green functions, and those are the slavnov taylor identities. The slavnov taylor identities are very general, and you have already seen many applications of them, and you have already seen many concrete slavnov taylor identities coming out of explicit tree-level calculations, which were then used to derive the unitarity of the S matrix or to establish Lorentz invariance or some other important properties. But now we discuss the general formalism, where they come from in general, how they are derived and how they look like on the level of full green functions, including higher orders. And then at the end of these sections, we will also see how the concrete identities that you have already seen, how they emerge from the general structure. So let us begin. Uh, as I said, we have a symmetry of the Lagrangian. And if the path integral measure is invariant, then we immediately obtain those slavnov taylor identities. And uh, we know at least one case where the path integral measure is indeed invariant, namely if we use dimensional regularization and if we are in D unequal to four dimensions. Then this is already established. So here, uh, if we have a BRST invariant classical Lagrangian, remember that I in Yao introduced the simple L classical CL for the Lagrangian, which does not yet have counter terms. Then this is BRST invariant, S of L classical equal zero. Then uh, from this general formalism, we immediately obtain slavnov taylor identities, which look like this. Uh, in symbolized form, zero is equal to the BRST transformation in quotation marks of green functions, where I already explained that I use this as an abbreviation of the sum of all green functions which you obtain by doing the variation of each individual field turn in turn. And uh, so the green functions here that uh, satisfy this are the green functions which you compute by using the Feynman rules from this L classical Lagrangian. We, in other words, these are the green functions that you obtain without counter terms. These are the so-called unrenormalized green functions, which certainly contain ultraviolet divergences. But uh, as long as D is unequal to 4, they are well defined and can be computed. And for any D unequal to 4, they satisfy these slavnov taylor identities. So let's write this down. These are the green functions <coughs> computed from L classical without counter terms. So, so called unrenormalized green functions. So, th they satisfy this Slavnov Taylor identity. And uh, then let us also look at the renormalized case. 
namely if we use uh, the full Lagrangian including counterterms, which we called L bare or L classical plus L counterterms, then this satisfies a new BRST symmetry, namely this S3 normalized acting on this equals zero. And then using the same general argument, we get, of course, zero is equal to this L uh, S3 normalized of renormalized green functions is also zero. So these are now the renormalized green functions from L classical plus L counter terms. We do not yet know whether those green functions are finite because we have not yet established that the counter terms are able to cancel the divergences. But anyway, if we define the counter terms in the way we did, then we know the Bayer Lagrangian is BRST invariant, and therefore we know that the renormalized green functions satisfy again such a Slavnov Taylor identity where the BRST transformations are modified by renormalization constants in the way we discussed. So, and just to make this clear, this is fully established. There is nothing to prove anymore. We have given the explicit proof of this in dimensional regularization. Just to be safe, we should keep d unequal to 4 because we do not know whether the limit d going to 4 exists. Um, but uh, in this sense, it is fully established. And if it turns out that the limit d going to 4 exists, since the 1 over epsilon poles cancel, then of course this remains true also for d equal to 4. Um, and uh, then we have established the slavnov taylor identities for the renormalized theory. Okay, and now um, I w just want to show you a concrete application of the slavnov taylor identities. So this is a general thing, and uh, what does it have to do with the concrete identities that you have already seen a few times in the lecture and in the exercise? Let us just look at one single example, namely the relation for the uh, photon or gluon self energy. As an example application. So we uh, define the full photon propagator with all Feynman diagrams and two external let's say, uh, gluon fields, did I say photon, I'm sorry, so gauge field uh, two-point function with two gauge fields, A mu A and A nu B, uh, and the full green function including all possible Feynman diagrams, not necessarily one particle irreducible. And let us see what kind of slavnov taylor identity this object fulfills. For simplicity, let's do it without counter terms. Even though with counter terms, the structure would not really change at all, but uh, just to have a concrete notation, let's do it without counter terms. All right, let me immediately uh, show you the Slavnov Taylor identity that we need in order to get information on that. It is the following. We take zero is equal in quotation marks to one such uh, BRST transformation of a green function in quotation marks. And which green function should we take here? Let us take this one, uh, C bar A of X, B, B of Y. Okay. So this is a green function here or an expectation value of an anti-ghost field and the auxiliary field B. And then this expression in quotation marks, as I said, this is just a shorthand notation for the following, namely for what is it a shorthand notation? We now take the BRST transformation of all the individual field operators and add them up. So the first term is B 
BRST transformation of C bar at X times BB at Y. Then we need to anti-commute the BRST operator with C bar because they are both fermionic. Then, then we get minus C bar at X times the BRST transformation of B at Y. And that's it. So this is what I mean by this abbreviated symbolic notation. And that is the slavnov taylor identity that is guaranteed to hold. Now, what is that actually? What is the BRST transformation of the anti-ghost? Who knows it? You know it. Should have something to do with A? Uh, yeah, it has something to do with A. In fact, it is equal to B, and B has something to do with A. So uh, that was this uh, BRST doublet that was introduced at the end in order to uh, write down um, BRST invariant gauge fixing term. And uh, that was defined to be BA of X. Then we have this. And the BRST transformation of B was zero. Uh, that was the so-called BRST doublet. S of C bar is B, S of B is zero. So here we get zero. That is our slavnov taylor identity for the two-point function of the gauge field. So what is the identity? Zero is equal to this green function. That's it. That is our slavnov taylor identity. Let's write it down. So this holds at all orders in dimensional regularization, and that is guaranteed. Maybe uh, to stress it once more, we are using here the path integral definition of time ordering. So as I told you in the beginning, there is a slight difference at singular points between the path integral of um, the, uh, the time ordering defined via the path integral and via theta functions in the operator formalism. And uh, all of this holds in the sense of the path integral time ordering using time ordering of the path integral. So this is our slavnov taylor identity. Now, as you might see, this is not really yet an identity for the two-point function of a mu a nu. So we have to rearrange it a little bit. And uh, the rearrangement that we now do is not really a slavnov taylor identity as such, but it is a different identity. But this is the core. And from this, we will derive our uh, interesting information on the AMU. So what is the relation to AMU? That goes via equations of motion or these uh, Dyson-Schwinger equations that we have also introduced. So in a way, this is a kind of trivial relationship. Let's uh, nevertheless derive it uh, really from the path integral in the way we did it. Namely, we take a total derivative in the path integral uh, d by db a of x, total derivative with respect to b a in the path integral of the following of b b at y times e to the i times the action. And we are using the classical action at the moment. So this is zero, um, as we discussed, and uh, such e equations yield Dyson-Schwinger equations, or in other words, uh, relationships for green functions involving equations of motion. And uh, OK, so let's evaluate it. Mm -hmm. 
let's factor out uh, the usual exponential. And then uh, in front of the exponential, we have two terms. One term comes from taking the derivative of b with respect to b. That gives a delta function, Kronecker delta ab times a four-dimensional delta function of x minus y. And on the other hand, we get a term from the product rule from taking the derivative of e to the i times the action. Then we have the prefactor bb of y, and then times the derivative of i times the action with respect to b, and that gives the equation of motion of b. And that was what you had in mind, maybe, namely the equation of motion relates b to d mu a mu like in the gauge fixing. And that is what we now get. So we get here times i, and then times the equation of motion. The equation of motion is, if we take the derivative, xi times b a plus d mu a a mu. Then we have this equation of motion. So and then we have here three terms the sum of three terms is zero. The first term is a delta function. The second term, uh, if you evaluate the path integral, this gives a green function b, b, b. And the third term is a green function b and a. So let's write it down. Evaluating the path integral gives then this, Kronecker delta times a delta function, x minus y, plus the green function times i of b a at x, b b at y, plus i times xi times the green function uh, d mu a mu a at x times b b at y. So in that is what you see from this equation of motion or Dyson-Schwinger equation. You can replace uh, b by its equation of motion, uh, but it, the green function with b or with its equation of motion is not exactly the same, but you get an extra term involving a delta function. This is the typical thing from these Dyson-Schwinger equations. Okay, now we can plug in our Slavnov-Taylor identity, which tells us that this is zero. That was what we have derived before. And then we see that that green function here between a and b uh, gives just the delta function and nothing else. So maybe we can write it also in Fourier transformed form, then we get zero is equal to delta AB, just the Fourier transformation of a delta function into momentum space gives just one, and then plus I times xi times the Fourier transformation of the green function here, let's say Fourier transformation uh, evaluated at some momentum flow p. What does that mean in terms of Feynman diagrams? So in terms of Feynman diagrams, we can write down that green function here, i times xi, and then we have here a green function between a and b. This is basically a green function. Uh, on the one hand side, we have a, a, mu. Then we have all Feynman diagrams, and then at the end, we get b, b. And there flows a momentum through it, P flows through the green function, and uh, the a mu is taken derivative of 
in momentum space d mu becomes minus i times p mu uh, of the momentum which flows into the A field. Okay. So in this green function here, apparently is equal to minus Kronecker delta AB at all orders. Now, the right-hand side here is an exact expression which uh, contains no higher orders. It is a tree-level expression. It is just a lowest order expression with no higher orders in the coupling constant in perturbation theory. That means all higher order corrections vanish. That means here on the left-hand side, in terms of Feynman diagrams, there will be a tree-level graph, a one-loop graph, two-loop graphs, and so on. And that means the tree-level graph must be equal to this, whereas all the higher order correction Feynman diagrams must be zero. That is the result of this equation here. So at tree level, it means, let's say, psi times p mu times a green function, tree level green function between a and b with uh, no loop in between is just minus Kronecker delta AB. That means this green function here has the following value. Which value does it have? It must have the value P mu divided by P square times 1 over Xi. Okay. Because then if you contract with another P mu and multiply by Xi, you get minus Kronecker delta AB. So, and this green function exists. So it's an unusual green function. It's like a propagator Feynman rule, but it's a propagator which connects two different kinds of fields. And uh, that is possible. I told you that in general, the propagators in Feynman diagrams, they are the inverse of the differential operator in the Lagrangian. Uh, and that is to be understood in a matrix sense. If we have many fields in the Lagrangian, like A mu and B, then the differential operator is a matrix in the space of all those fields, and the inverse matrix can have uh, off-diagonal components. This is such an off-diagonal component of the inverse of the differential operator. And so we have here such a three-level two-point function, in other words, a propagator between two different kinds of fields. This is nothing to worry about, and one could immediately calculate it from inverting the differential operator. But here we get the result from the Dyson-Schwinger equation. Yeah. Okay, so this is the result for this three-level Feynman graph. Yes, please. Yeah, Fourier transform of a delta function is one. Right. Uh, well, exponential of uh, e. Uh, yeah, okay, but we split that off. So Fourier transformation with respect to this exact argument x minus y, then this is just one. Uh, no, but we split, uh, we, the variable in the Fourier transformation is the difference x minus y. We do not do an uh, individual Fourier transformation with respect to x, but directly to x minus y, and then the Fourier transform of that is one. Indeed, if, if uh, we were taking a Fourier transform with respect to x, then we would get uh, e to the i p y, maybe as a result. If we would take a Fourier transform with respect to y, we would get e to the i p x in the result. But if we take Fourier transform with respect to x minus y, we get one. Okay, now let's look at higher orders. At higher orders, this combination here uh, has the following structure. So what are the loop graphs contributing to a green function with external A and external B? If 
we have the following propagators and propagator Feynman rules available. We have now, as you see from here, we have an unusual Feynman rule available where a B directly connects to A with a tree-level propagator. But of course, we also have ordinary gauge boson propagators available. But we do not have available a propagator B to B that is not available because that is zero. So the only two interesting propagators which appear are this one and that one. That means the only thing an external B can do is to go into A. That's absolutely the only possibility. So therefore, in every Feynman diagram, no matter how complicated it is, the external B that starts at this point has only one possibility. It can only turn into an A. And then either this is immediately the tree-level graph and the whole Feynman diagram ends here, or the A does now something complicated. And so all the higher order graphs must have this structure. B goes to A and then A does something complicated and at the end we get another A. And uh, therefore, we now see uh, all higher orders. We now see that uh, this building block here must be zero. And uh, this building block um, is a full all higher orders photon two-point function times that object times minus p mu divided by xi over p square. Okay. And so that must vanish. And so we see from this that the contraction of the two-point function with two external vector bosons times p mu vanishes. That is the essential point. So in other words, uh, we already had introduced the self-energy sigma mu nu AB of two gauge fields uh, that if you contract it with P mu, then this must vanish. That is the outcome. And that is the impact of this particular slavnov taylor identity plus equations of motion. We see that the gluon self-energy must be transverse at all orders in perturbation theory, at least in dimensional regularization at d unequal to 4. And this is something that you should also calculate as an exercise and uh, hopefully at the one loop level. And uh, let's see in the afternoon whether it worked or not. But that is the prediction that at all orders the gluon self energy is transverse. And it is an example of how you can derive um, slavnov taylor identities for concrete green functions of interest from the general recipe. OK, any questions to this? No, it's not. I mean, you are completely right in picturing it as an abbreviation for its value from the equation of motion. And um, so it's here really a uh, kind of artificial tool which we uh, use in order to simplify the derivation of slavnov taylor identities. In principle, it could also be possible to completely eliminate the B from all equations entirely, and then the slavnov taylor identities and BRS transformations would take a slightly more complicated form. Deriving such identities would be a little bit maybe more cumbersome, but the final result must always be the same, absolutely the same. Um, but here we use it as a tool. And 
And so th that is uh, the way I would use it also in practical calculations, namely as a tool to simplify the discussion of BRST symmetry and to simplify the derivation of slavnov taylor identities. But as you see here, at one place of the derivation, we do exactly what you have in mind, namely we eliminate the B by using its equation of motion. However, there is one trick which is a little bit subtle um, and which is this equation here, namely you cannot just uh, always uh, replace B by its value from the equation of motion with no other modification because then you would not see this delta function here. That is the only thing that you need to uh, take care about. And so here, that's why we started with a path integral derivation of this equation of motion relationship. And so you see that uh, here in principle, if that were zero, that is also zero, then you would say, ah, okay, the green function with psi times b is the same as the green function with d mu a mu, which means you can replace it by its value from the equation of motion. But it's not the same because of the delta function. And this delta function is again coming from the singularities where at equal space time points uh, there are singularities. And uh, so that is an extra term that you need to take into account. And this extra term it appears exactly only in one place of the entire theory, namely in this case. In every other green function, so if you would take anything else, not B here, but any other field, then the derivative with respect to B would just be blind to those fields and there would not be a delta function. And then you would derive an equation exactly like you have in mind, namely a green function with lots of fields and one B is the same as the green function with lots of fields and D mu A mu. So as long as you have green functions with just one B, you can replace B by its value of the equation of motion. But only in this case, there is a difference and this is the one that we used here to derive identities. So, but B is completely unphysical and it's just a placeholder and an abbreviation which uh, can be used in equations like these. Yep. So I see why the, our final statement, the self metric effect of the, uh, the momentum continuum holds and this zero, but why does it hold in every unit order? Because our derivation of these uh, Slavnov Taylor identities is completely independent of the loop order. So um, that's just an exact relationship for the full green function. And uh, the special case is the tree level. So tree level behaves in a special way, but everything else is uniformly treated here, sub subsumed uh, in this equality. Yep. That was this point here. So. Um, um, okay, you can also explain it in a few other ways. But it was here. Uh, that green function, whatever it might be, times p mu gives a delta function. And then I said, okay, that must mean that this green function here has this value proportional to p mu divided by p square. Because now if you contract with that p mu, you get uh, one, right? That was this place. And where does the first from? from uh, it was already here, and it came from the derivative d mu a mu. And uh, there is also another uh, thing that you can say, namely from Lorentz invariance alone, if you have such a green function in momentum space, then. Uh, because we are in a Lorentz covariant quantization, so uh, then we know that this must behave in a Lorentz covariant way. It has one Lorentz index, it depends on one P, so the only possibility is that it is proportional to P mu times some function which might depend on P square. So that is also clear from Lorentz invariance alone. And then if you know this together with that, then it, uh, this is the unique answer.
you could have asked also another question, so let me point you to that other question. Namely, you could have asked yourself or me why the derivation was different from the derivation of the transversality of the photon self-energy in QED. Because we derived already that the photon self-energy is transverse. We de used it in quantum field theory one, and we also derived it here some weeks ago. And that derivation was different from this one. So you can now think about that at home. Not now, but later maybe. What happens if you apply the QED derivation uh, to this case? And I hope we will come back to that maybe. Uh, if I will tell you the resolution of that paradox in a few weeks, I guess. That's all. In other words, the derivation in QED was more straightforward than here, and that same derivation doesn't work in non-abelian gauge, gauge theories. But the result, nevertheless, also holds, but one needs to use that uh, other derivation using the B-field. Now, let us go to the next topic. I have now explained to you how the slavnov taylor identities uh, work. I have given you one example, and of course there could be infinitely more examples. But this single example is, I think, enough to explain the sketch of the renormalization, re renormalizability proof. So as you probably know, uh, non-abelian gauge theories like QCD or the electroweak standard model, they are renormalizable as we call it. And establishing this was a big step in our understanding of uh, nature. And so let me give you some names. Toft was the first who gave a renormalizability proof of those uh, theories. Then there were important contributions by Lee, Zin, Justin, and in the end also BRS, using BRS T symmetry. And it works by induction. And let me sketch the two steps of such an inductive proof of renormalizability. Um, let us first assume that the theory is already renormalized up to order n minus 1. So that would mean loop order n minus 1. Using the renormalization transformation of our section 261, where I gave you the recipe how to generate counterterms by doing this transformation. Gauge coupling goes to Z times gauge coupling fields go to square root of Z times the fields. And in this way, you generate a certain structure of a counterterm Lagrangian. And we have up to order n minus 1 loop determined the counterterms uh, from that Lagrangian such that the theory has become finite. So that means uh, we have obtained L counter term up to this order uh, that is equivalent to having a bare Lagrangian up to this order. And these renormalization constants delta Zi up to this order, they are all defined. And uh, we assume that the green functions are finite. That means the limit d equal to 4 exists at the order n minus 1. And that includes 
the green functions needed for the Slavnov Taylor identities. For the Slavnov Taylor identities, we need green functions where uh, these operators corresponding to BRST transformations appear. So, and then uh, S renormalized of phi, mm. those are these renormalized BRST transformations. And they are so called composite operators, they involve products of operators at the same space time point. So, th there are special Feynman diagrams for mm. those green functions, and they involve extra divergences on top of the normal green functions. And uh, we assume that they are also finite, and the ordinary green functions, they are, are finite too. Needed for the Slavnov Taylor identity. So they are all finite. And uh, we also assume that the Slavnov Taylor identity holds. But that is not a necessary, the assumption is not needed because we have already proven that if we define the counter terms in that way, then the Slavnov Taylor identity definitely holds. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I write it down here. It's a necessary ingredient for the proof. So, and first of all, um, this is clearly possible at tree level. Where n minus 1 equals 0. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, there is a beginning to our inductive proof. And so now we assume it for n minus 1 bigger than 0. And then we do an induction step. Okay, so that is just a sketch of the proof. So let us imagine what one in principle has to do. What one has to do is you now go to the next order. You go to the order n loop. And at the order n loop, a renormalization must cancel the appearing divergences. So you need to study the structure of the possible divergences. Study the most general possible structure of appearing ultraviolet divergences at the next order, order n. And how can such a study proceed? You want to study it without actual calculation, of course, because we want to do it for general n. So we cannot do actual explicit computations. We must study it on the basis of general principles. So what are the principles that we have available in order to study the general possible divergences which could appear at any order n? One principle that we have available is that we, what we have just seen on the previous blackboard, namely the slavnov taylor identity. For example, for the photon self-energy. We have just seen that the photon self-energy is transverse at all orders of perturbation theory um, before doing renormalization. That means including the divergences. So the divergences of the photon self-energy are of course also transverse. So we know already something about the possible structure of all divergences. If you contract the divergent part of the photon self-energy with p mu, you get zero. Things like this can be obtained from the slavnov taylor identity. So one thing for sure is the divergences are restricted by the slavnov taylor identity. For example, uh, the gluon self-energy, sigma mu nu, for example, including the divergent part times p mu gives zero. Okay. That is a restriction. And of course, now the point would be, and your task, if you would carry out the proof, then you study all such restrictions of all divergences following from the slavnov taylor identity. 
and that was done exactly in those proofs. So, and the second thing, divergences are always restricted by the general theorem of renormalization. The general theorem of renormalization tells you that if a theory is finite up to order n minus 1, then at the next order n, the divergences are so-called local. They are in momentum space polynomial in the momenta and not other functions of the momenta. So they are polynomial in the momenta and the degree of the polynomial is also known. Namely, the divergences of one particle irreducible green functions is a polynomial in the external momenta and the degree of the polynomial is the degree of superficial divergence of the green function. So this is completely known by the general theorem. And just as a reference, this general theorem of renormalization was explained, for example, in our quantum field theory 1A lecture 2019. That was lecture 11 and 12, approximately. And it was also explained in the multi-loop lecture. Uh, basically lecture 1 to 10 that contained essentially the full proof of this. Okay, so there are two restrictions, namely um, in momentum space polynomial of a certain degree and uh, the degree is uh, very low. So the degree of divergence is either zero or one or two. So that means our divergences are polynomials of zero degree, which means they are a constant or they are proportional to one momentum, or at most they are quadratic in the momentum. So for example, for the photons or gluon self-energy, it has the highest possible degree of divergence two. Therefore, for that we know uh, the divergence must be a polynomial of second degree in the momentum. And from the other blackboard, we know it's transverse, and then we know what, uh, exactly what the form of the divergence is. So let's write this maybe as an example. Example, uh, sigma mu nu divergence at order n uh, is a polynomial in second degree, let's say a times p mu p nu plus b times p uh, square times g mu nu. Of course, we are also restricted by Lorentz covariance, and then we know that this is the only possibility that can appear. And p mu times sigma mu nu divergence is zero, and then we know that actually the structure of the divergence at the order n is given by common prefactor A times P mu P nu minus P square G mu nu. And then we know that this can be cancelled by uh, this counter term that we have already derived, which had the result minus I times delta Z A times exactly this g mu nu p square minus p mu p nu. Okay, so we already showed that our renormalization transformation leads to a counterterm structure like this, where the gluon self-energy counterterm has a transverse part only, and the prefactor is a constant delta z a. And now we learn from the main theorem of renormalization, the <coughs> divergent part must have this structure from the slavnov taylor identity, we know transversality in combination. We know that the divergence looks like that 
therefore it is now established that it can be cancelled indeed by this counter term structure. That is how it works. And that is what you need to do in general for all green functions. We have now done it for the gluon self energy and you must uh, walk through all the possible green functions that can exist in the theory and which can have possible divergencies. And then for all possible green functions which can be divergent, you must show using the same kind of argument that the divergence has exactly the structure that uh, can be cancelled by the counter term Lagrangian that we introduced last week. And that is true. So if you go through this analysis, then you see indeed that all ultraviolet divergences can be cancelled by the counter terms of the structure of our section 261. And that is then the induction step from n minus 1 to n. This is therefore possible. And that is the full proof of renormalizability of these Young Mills theories. Okay, that's the end. That's how it works. And uh, so I would leave it at this sketch here. So to fill in the details, you would either on the one hand need to do the full proof of this main theorem of renormalization, which we did in the multi-loop lecture. And the other part is to go through this analysis here of applying the slavnov taylor identity to the divergencies and to show that that matches the counterterm structure. And for that analysis, I will show you a few techniques, I think, in a few weeks from now, so that you see a little bit more in detail how one can proceed in order to do it. But we uh, will first introduce a few other tools in between, uh, so that this analysis is then a little bit more straightforward. And this analysis is exactly what was done by all those authors and the most elegant form most likely is the one done by BRS uh, using BRS T symmetry. But essentially it was already done by the earlier works as well in a kind of similar logic. IR is not um, covered by the theory of renormalization. So IR divergencies happen once you go to uh, specific external momenta, for example, on-shell external momenta, then additional divergencies can appear from long distances and they have nothing to do with the renormalization um, procedure and therefore they remain, they remain. So uh, what is finite here? When I say green functions are finite, then I mean that the green functions are finite for generic external momenta, in particular for off-shell external momenta. So that means in momentum space, you have analytic functions of your momenta for many, many different momentum variables. But if you go to special points in momentum space, then you get additional singularities, which are not covered by that analysis. Of course, very important f special points, namely physical special points, the infrared divergencies appear uh, exactly when you want to compute physical observables. So they are very important and also very, uh, let's say, um, uh, very tedious to deal with because they appear exactly in the important cases. Nevertheless, uh, renormalization theory talks about the off-shell green functions for generic momenta. And first of all, we need to establish that for generic momenta, the green functions exist. And uh, then we can perform limits and deal with the uh, um, difficult limits in um, dedicated ways. Yep. Obvious in a way, yes. Um, of course, it's not obvious that the analysis works and leads to this result. I wouldn't uh, claim that this is obvious. But it's obvious that you can write down Slavnov-Taylor identities for all green functions because of this recipe. That is the recipe. And so, of course, here you can write down everything. 
and therefore you get for every green function that you can possibly imagine, you can write down suitable Slavonov Taylor identities, which will give you some restrictions. That is clear. And it's just uh, then to be worked out what are exactly the restrictions and whether they are the ones that you need, but they are. Let me end with some comments. So as an extension, sometimes um, the slavnov taylor identity may be broken in intermediate steps. Uh, via the regularization procedure. If that happens, the slavnov taylor identity is not automatically immediately valid, but then the slavnov taylor identity must be restored by adding extra special counterterms. Uh, but once you have restored the slavnov taylor identity by those extra special counterterms, then you can go on as before. And the final result is then also a fully renormalized theory, which is finite. and where the Slavnov taylor identity is valid. And that is, for example, the case in the electroweak standard model with, um, let's say, a rigorous treatment of gamma 5. because as I told you that we assume here at the moment that there is no gamma 5 in our theory, and that was the reason. So, but in all cases, regardless whether it's the more indirect or the direct case, the important outcome is that our renormalized theory has a valid slavnov taylor identity. So we can use the slavnov taylor identity then to constrain and understand the finite result of the green functions, which gives rise to the physical interpretation of the theory. And uh, its three parameters are the ones of the classical action, because in the course of the renormalization procedure, never have been uh, additional parameters been introduced. The parameters are always the ones from the classical action, because uh, we just introduced the counterterms by the renormalization transformation of those original three parameters. That means the number of parameters that you need to measure until you are able to make new predictions uh, is known, it is finite, and it is fixed, and uh, doesn't depend on the order of perturbation theory. So these are the two important consequences for the interpretation. Mm. Okay. I would now go on uh, with slavnov taylor identities. After sketching the proof of renormalizability, we are not yet done with interpreting and establishing Young-Mills theories. Namely, we also need to establish the physical properties of them, which are the properties that we discussed last week or two weeks ago, like unitarity of the physical S matrix, 
gauge independence of the S matrix, Lorentz invariance of S matrix elements despite not Lorentz covariant epsilon vectors and so on. And those properties we saw it at three level again depended on Slavnov Taylor identities, but in that case the Slavnov Taylor identities were not uh, restricting the divergences, but they were restricting finite parts and relationships between finite parts of green functions such that uh, those physical properties would hold at the end. We looked at it only at three level, where there are no divergences, but nevertheless, the identities were very important. So now we know that for the finite theory, the slavnov taylor identities are valid at all orders, and so we have a chance to basically repeat the discussion of those physical properties at all orders. And that is what I want to do to complete this section. And so first let me tell you a little bit about slavnov taylor identities in general uh, for S-matrix elements. And then we can sketch the applications uh, to the um, points that I mentioned. So, so far, we looked at slavnov taylor identities for green functions, where all the PIs were arbitrary. So-called off-shell. And that is obviously useful for renormalization. And in general, it's useful to study general properties. But now, let us look at S matrix elements. So we specialize the slavnov taylor identity to on-shell quantities, and in particular to the S matrix. And then we can study properties like the ones I just mentioned. That was section 252, 253 on the unitarity of the physical S matrix or uh, the gauge independence of the physical S matrix. Okay, and actually, um, maybe a question. I had prepared a few remarks on the relationship between green functions and S matrix elements in general, like the so-called LSZ reduction. Um, do you want me to discuss that or should we skip it? Since we didn't do it in quantum field theory one last semester, maybe uh, I should discuss it. I feel that would be important, but it takes a little bit of time. And uh, let me do it by an illustration, not with a general derivation, but let me just illustrate the point. So let us uh, look at three level cases. That was what we studied in quantum field theory 1b, in other words, in the last semester. There we had, for example, such um, a process like Compton scattering which consists of such Feynman diagrams here, this one and the one with crossed legs. And I told you and we derived completely how we obtain the S matrix and T matrix element uh, for such a process. And in words, the recipe was to have external wave functions for the external particles like spinors U bar and U and polarization vectors epsilon mu for the external photons. And then we have the usual Feynman rules for the inner line, like one over P slash minus M, and for the vertices, gamma mu, gamma nu, and so on. So we derive the Feynman rules for this. Uh, let me do a simpler example. For example, this process, uh, just photon going to E plus, E minus, 
in quotation marks because uh, the photon cannot decay into E plus E minus in reality, but let's just pretend it could. Then the Feynman rules for this would be the following. We have a, a spinor U bar for the outgoing electron, uh, U bar with the argument P prime. Then we have the vertex Feynman rule minus I E Q gamma mu for the vertex here, and we have a spinor U of P for the outgoing positron. And, uh, or let's say V of, let's say, let's do it correctly, V of P like this. And we have a polarization vector epsilon mu of K for the incoming photon. Okay, so that would be the Feynman rule for this S matrix element, if it were a physical process. Okay, now, um, let's compare it to a green function. Let's compare it to a green function, psi, psi bar, and a mu. let's say A mu. Fourier transformed such that here, let's say, uh, we, uh, okay, let's first write down the Feynman diagrams. What are the Feynman diagrams for this green function? The Feynman diagram for the green function, the simplest one would of course be the same. So here we have a Feynman diagram for that green function. Namely, uh, the green function corresponds to all Feynman diagrams with external fields A, Psi, bar, Psi. So here we have the external A nu. Here we have the external Psi bar. And here we have the external Psi. Now, what is the difference between that Feynman diagram and this one? I try to highlight the difference graphically by writing dots at the end of those lines here. The difference is that here, this Feynman diagram contains Feynman rules for the external lines, and the external lines in this Feynman diagram, they are simply propagator Feynman rules. So here, I get the following result for this diagram, namely, I get, let's start here with this line, I get a Feynman rule for this line, which is simply I divided by P prime slash minus M. This is just a propagator Feynman rule. Then I have this vertex here, minus I E Q gamma mu. Then we have this propagator Feynman rule, I divided by P slash minus M. And here we have a propagator for the photon field, which connects here the A mu with an A nu photon field. So we have a propagator minus I divided by uh, K square times G mu nu minus K mu K nu divided by K square times one minus Xi. Okay. So this is the value of that Feynman diagram for a green function. And now the point I want to make is uh, to analyze the difference. What is the difference between the Feynman diagram for such a green function and the Feynman diagram for a T matrix element? And you see it. The difference is that for the green function, we have propagators for the external lines, namely here for the three external lines, we have three propagators here, the electron propagator, uh, positron propagator, photon propagator. And uh, instead, in the S matrix, we have spinors or polarization vectors for the external states. But the vertex for the inner vertex is the same. So and that is the general relationship. Uh, you can go from green functions to the S matrix by stripping away the external propagators and replacing them by those um, spinors or in general wave functions for the external particles. That is just the difference. 
and uh, so uh, then also the green function here is defined for arbitrary external momenta. The momenta do not have to be on shell. They can be anything. But if you put the external momenta to an on shell value, for example, photon k square equals zero, what happens with the green function if k square goes to zero? Jonas? You can look at all these different factors until you see something that happens for k square going to zero. Divergent. It is divergent. What happens if uh, p square goes to m square? It's not so easy to see, but this thing here is of course the same as p slash plus m divided by p square minus m square, and so it is also divergent. So if the external momenta become on shell, the same for p square going, p prime square going to m square, then this is divergent. So this green function has a pole if k square goes to zero. It also has a pole if p square goes to m square, and it has a pole if p prime square goes to m square. So these general green functions, they have poles whenever an external momentum goes to an on-shell value equal to the mass of the respective particle. So those green functions have poles. And uh, so the relationship uh, between the green function is now a little bit more tricky. So first of all, the S matrix is calculated for on-shell momenta. So here, P square is equal to M square, P prime square is equal to M square, K square is equal to zero. And exactly those values are impossible to take in the green function because of the poles. So in the, the, therefore the relationship is you strip away the external propagators. After doing that, the green function, the remainder uh, is finite if you go to the poles. The, so then you set all the momenta to the on-shell values and then you multiply with those external wave functions and then you get the S matrix. That is the recipe going from here to here. So uh, remove external propagators on shell limit multiply with wave functions gives you a green function produces then such a T matrix element. Okay, that is the recipe. And this recipe, uh, yeah. It is a recipe, right? So you strip away the propagators. After stripping away the propagators, you remain with this. And then you multiply with wave functions. So you multiply with u bar and u and epsilon. That is the recipe. Okay, it's a recipe. Yeah, yeah, but I don't really see what it gets us. Or, I mean, it's, it's what it gets us is it goes from here to here. You start by having a green function, but you want an S matrix element. So you ask, how can I obtain an S matrix element if I have only a green function? That is a good question because now we have studied renormalization of gauge theories and we have canceled divergences and so on, so all we know are green functions. We do not yet know S matrix elements, but green functions we know. The renormalization that we have just sketched five minutes ago, um, uh, tells us that we know for sure green functions exist. Therefore, green functions for us are now the more basic building blocks. 
but of course we want S matrix elements. And so uh, your question should be, how can I get S matrix elements if I have green functions? And so therefore I wrote down a three level example which you can understand from last semester's lecture. And then you see these three differences. Here there are extra external propagators. Let's get rid of them. Then the momentum uh, must be on shell. After getting rid of the propagators, we can set the momentum on shell. And then we are still not there, but we need to multiply with those external wave functions. And if we do all these three steps, then we go from a green function to an S matrix element. So you wondered where the wave functions come from or what do? Yes, yes. And strip away, you can mathematically formulate it exactly by multiplying with the inverse uh, of a propagator because there is a precisely known Feynman rule for every external propagator and of course it's a well-defined um, calculation to multiply with the inverse. You multiply with the inverse and then you take the on-shell limit and then that limit will exist and it gives you in this case, just this result, afterwards you multiply with the wave. You also had a question? Yes, I was just wondering if it's also possible to go into go the other direction with matrix. Mm. I guess it's more difficult, right? <laughs> yeah, um, in some sense, if you would have a theory where somebody gives you only S matrix elements and you might know them as numbers, then it's a little bit difficult and tricky to go from these numbers to the green functions because those numbers would be defined uh, after contracting with the wave functions. That of course uh, you re reduces the information that you have and you only know it for on-shell momenta. Yes, yes. So you would have to kind of extrapolate to off-shell momenta and that might not be unique. And actually it is not unique, so you might describe the same S matrix from different uh, green functions. In fact, that is, that is also a possibility that is sometimes made use of. And so the opposite way is um, not unique. But uh, of course, in, in a way it is possible because you can um, kind of interpret green functions as generalized S matrix elements of some theories, but um, it is not a unique procedure to do that. But if you have green functions in a theory, then you can construct an S matrix element. And so what I have told you now is an observation that is true at three level and the so-called LSZ formalism and LSZ reduction theorem, which is a theorem of uh, axiomatic quantum field theory, tells us that this same recipe is actually true Exactly, non-perturbatively for um, arbitrary quantum field theories. And uh, it works if you have green functions given at all orders, let's say, then the essentially same recipe uh, brings you from those green functions of some renormalized theory to the S matrix elements of the same theory. And so that is the way how we can define S matrix elements at higher orders for generic quantum field theories, even without using perturbation theory. Because in our quantum field theory one lecture, we used uh, the so-called time-ordered perturbation theory to derive the Feynman rules for, green, for S matrix elements, then we obtained that result. Uh, if one would apply the same strategy at higher orders, one would still get some results, but uh, it would always remain perturbative. It would agree with what I tell you now, but the LSZ formalism is even uh, valid non-perturbatively. So let me just uh, quote the LSC reduction statement, which is essentially this recipe. And we derived this in quantum field theory 1A uh, in section 4. So, and uh, let me just write down a simple graphical version. 
which uh, explains the recipe. Namely, if you have a TFI matrix element, then this is given by, let's say, the appropriate green function. By appropriate green function, I mean, of course, a green function which has the correct structure of external legs, external particles, so that you have a chance of describing with that green function the process that you are interested in. Then you amputate the external legs and then you multiply with the following, let's say 1 over square root of, uh, that should be a curly z, curly z square root times wave functions of all external particles. So it is exactly the same recipe as here. The only difference is this uh, 1 over square root of curly z, which is the following. where 1 over square root of curly z is determined by the following. Let me write it down for scalar fields. Namely, you take the full green function of such a scalar field and I take a scalar field because then we do not have uh, p slash or uh, such a complicated Lorentz structure which I would need to write down. Then the Lorentz structure is simply that this green function behaves like 1 over p square minus m square plus i epsilon. And the tree level propagator for a scalar field would be just i divided by that, right? i divided by p square minus m square plus i epsilon. And at all orders, such a two-point function for a scalar field can be written like i times square root of curly z divided by p square minus the physical mass square m square physical plus i epsilon plus additional terms without pole at p square equal m physical square. So that is the general structure of such a two-point function. At three level it is just i divided by a pole. At higher orders it still has a pole. Maybe the position of the pole is shifted from the three level mass to some new mass which we then call the physical mass. But it still has a pole or it might have a pole. Uh, the pole position has shifted the residue has shifted and the residue at the pole is now called curly z. In some cases it might even become zero, but uh, in general the residue uh, is called z and of course uh, the modification also leads to terms which have no pole, but around the pole we can always approximate such a two-point function in this way. So compared to tree level shifted residue and shifted position of the pole and the residue is called curly z and this has the interpretation of a normalization factor. So this gives the normalization of the external fields and we need to divide by that normalization factor in order to have proper normalization of our matrix elements if we want to interpret them as probability amplitudes. So they need an absolute fixed normalization and that normalization comes from here. So that is uh, the outcome of the LSC theorem which we derived in that lecture. It is non-perturbatively valid and it boils down to that recipe that we have just uh, observed at tree level. And so here um, another answer to your question, where do the wave functions come from, is uh, the proof of this LSE theorem it produces after a certain series of steps, uh, exactly this result here. The proof is not totally simple, but uh, also not uh, 
prohibitively difficult. Okay, now we have not yet discussed slavnov taylor identities for the S matrix. We've only discussed the S matrix, but now you see what becomes possible. <laughs> Namely, if you have green functions and you can construct S matrix elements just from green functions by that recipe, it enables you also to derive slavnov taylor identities for the S matrix by using the slavnov taylor identity for the green functions and applying the same recipe. In this way, you will automatically obtain some relationships for S matrix elements. And those are slavnov taylor identities for the S matrix. And let's just see how much we can, okay, we cannot do very much. Um, but let me write down the general structure and then um, let's discuss whether we can go on in the afternoon or next week. So let me introduce a notation which uh, shows you also uh, what we will be able to do. So notation for the LSC reduction. And uh, for simplicity in the following, we simply assume that this curly Z is equal to one. Then we do not have to carry it around in equations and it is uh, no loss of generality to assume it is one because you can always renormalize your fields in such a way that the two point function here has residue one. And so let's assume it and it makes the equations a little bit simpler. So then we introduce the following notation. So here some notation for a green function and then we write it like this, amputated and on shell. And uh, that is basically uh, applying the recipe above. So we take a green function. Um, so let's write it down. It is defined as taking the green function in momentum space. And then we multiply with the inverse propagators. Which is the recipe to cancel the external propagators or to strip them away, but mathematically we can really multiply with the inverse. Then after multiplying with the inverse, we take the limit where all the external momenta pi square go to the corresponding uh, physical masses where the external propagators have poles. And at the end, we multiply um, with a wave functions. However, I put the last point in bracket if, uh, yeah, let's say needed. Uh, the last step will be sometimes omitted in order to have more general relationships, but uh, we will see that. The main point is that we amputate the external legs and go on shell. And this is a recipe which leads you uh, from the green functions towards the S matrix. And now, of course, you can co sort of sense what we will do later, namely we take a slavnov taylor identity which gives us a relationship between different green functions, sum of green functions is zero, then the entire equation is of course valid for all momenta, so we take it, amputate and go on shell, and then we derive an identity as a corollary from that. And that identity will have special properties, there will be dramatic simplifications and therefore it's uh, important and worthwhile to study those resulting identities separately. And those are the identities which one needs to look at unitarity of the physical S matrix and so on. Okay, so that ends our lecture, but there is a question, okay. yes. I guess this scheme enables us to transport every identity that holds forward. Yes, yes. Identity. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yes, indeed, yes. Yes, not all of the resulting identities will be interesting, however, um, but we will see what kind of simplifications will emerge. And uh, yeah, okay, uh, let's continue with our lecture. Um, 
on Slavnov Taylor identities for on shell green functions, which are the building blocks of S matrix elements. And uh, let us apply what we did in the morning to Slavnov Taylor identities. So we do exactly what I already outlined. We begin with a Slavnov Taylor identity. This is a generic Slavnov Taylor identity with this abbreviated notation, where the notation means that we apply all the BRS transformations of all the individual fields. And after doing it, we amputate the external legs and go on shell. So we apply this algorithm of multiplying with the inverse external propagators and then performing the limit of on shell external momenta. So how do the resulting terms look like? So one term would, for example, be phi 1, and then here there is one BRS transformation of one of the field operators in the middle, and we go on shell and amputate. Now, how do the BRS transformations actually look like? There are two different ways how they can look like, or there are two different kinds of terms in the BRST transformations. And we now must distinguish between the two kinds of terms. We already stressed a few times the differences. Namely, one possibility is the result is linear. And by linear, I mean linear in all the quantum field operators of the theory. A uh, small check, who remembers a term in a BRS transformation which is linear in the quantum fields? What, for example, would be the term which is linear on the right hand side? The derivative d mu c. And actually, for non-abelian theories, that your example is the best example, because the BRST transformation is the covariant derivative of the ghost. And that contains a normal derivative of the ghost, but it also contains a term proportional to a mu times c. Now, that is linear in the quantum fields. That is a quantum field. So this is linear in quantum fields, but that is not linear, but uh, bilinear in the quantum fields of the theory. So this is a term which is linear, and uh, on the other hand, there are nonlinear terms. And your example shows how both kinds of terms look like. For example, uh, let's briefly, re so that is the BRS transformation of C. What is the BRS transformation of a quark field, for example? How does it look like? It's an infinitesimal gauge transformation of a quark where the gauge transformation parameter is replaced by a Fadeev Popov ghost. So you have minus i times gauge coupling times c times the quark field. So that, is it linear or nonlinear? It's nonlinear, right? So it contains ghost times a quark field. So that has no linear term. That, uh, sorry, that has one linear and one nonlinear term. Okay, so let us now go on. How do Feynman diagrams look like which result from the linear terms? Such Feynman diagrams uh, look like follows. So a linear term, S of phi L, would be something, let's say, proportional to some yet another field phi k, but only one phi k. So then what stands here is a green function phi 1, phi 2, and so on, and then phi k, and so on, up to phi n. So that is just an ordinary green function with an external field phi k. Therefore, it looks like this. Here we have phi k, 
then it goes on in the normal way. Then we have all kinds of Feynman diagrams, and then we have all the other fields. Okay. So this is an ordinary green function with lots of external fields. What, however, happens in the nonlinear case? So, for example, here, let's say we have phi k times phi j as an example, product of two field operators. Then we have here an expectation value of a product of elementary fields. And here we have a product of two fields at the same space time point. So that actually is similar to what you have if you derive Feynman rules. If you derive Feynman rules, then you know that here you have i times integral over an interaction Lagrangian. The interaction Lagrangian contains many products of fields at the same space time points. And what are the Feynman rules for those terms out of L int? They correspond to vertices, where several lines go to the same space time point. And that is exactly the same case here. So here we will have now at an external point, we have a vertex where two lines end. One line corresponds to phi k, one line corresponds to phi j. That is the external point of the Feynman di diagrams, which is the counterpart of that external point over there. And then you have all Feynman diagrams and otherwise, you have ordinary external fields, phi 1 up to phi n. But this special point is an external point on to which directly two lines must be attached. Whereas here, you have an external point with one line attached. Now, what does that mean in momentum space? In momentum space, you do a Fourier transformation, then it at each external point, there is now a momentum inflowing. So here you have external momentum PL inflowing, PL here momentum P1 flows in and so on. And here also overall the momentum PL flows into the diagram. And remember, we want to amputate the external legs and go on shell. That means we multiply with the inverse of the external propagators. That means, in particular, we multiply with the uh, PL square minus M square. We multiply with PL square minus M square. And uh, then we set PL square equal to M square afterwards. That means we get a non-zero contribution if the Feynman diagram to begin with uh, contained 1 over PL square minus M square. This is an ordinary line which has an ordinary Feynman rule for a line. Uh, it might contain 1 over PL square minus M square. So this might contain a pole. Like 1 over PL square minus M square. However, here that is not possible. This cannot contain a pole because the momentum PL is immediately distributed uh, into the two lines. So for example, we get one line PL minus K and here we just get the momentum K at the other line. And k might either be a loop momentum, which is integrated over, or it is some other momentum. Anyway, uh, there is nothing uh, which contains a pole 1 over PL square. PL square doesn't exist. So therefore, this cannot contain a pole. So. Therefore, there is something important which happens if we go on shell and amputate the external legs. Namely, the terms resulting from nonlinear expressions in the BRST transformations, they completely drop out. That is the dramatic simplification I announced. Most BRST transformations are nonlinear. They all drop out. The only thing that does not drop out is the linear part 
of BRST transformations, like for example this term. Everything else will drop out if we amputate and go on shell. So, in this amputate on shell, only linear terms in S phi i can contribute. And that is a big simplification. And just to note it and to not forget about it, let us to write down the complete list of all linear BRST transformations. Here is already one, but let's be complete. So the linearized version is linearized of A mu is D mu C A. And the nonlinear part drops out. So then the linearized BRST transformation of a gluon field is abelian. The non-abelian part drops out and it looks like the abelian BRST transformation of a photon field. What other linear BRST transformations are non-zero? For example, quark BRST transformations become zero. What else is non-zero? Right, as linearized on C bar gives B, that is linear. And S of B is zero. Anything else? What is the BRS transformation of a ghost? Yeah, so that is also nonlinear. So that's the that's all. That's all. That is the only nonlinear, uh, uh, only linear BRST transformation as rest is all zero. So that is a dramatic simplification. Almost everything is now uh, zero. By the way, this changes in um, Higgs theory. If you have spontaneously broken gauge theory, then there are some additional linear parts of the BRST transformations, which have to do with the Goldstone bosons and the masses of gauge bosons. And uh, as you know, uh, I hope you know, um, what does it mean if something is BRST invariant? It has the chance of being something physical. So the BRST invariant stuff, like for example the quarks, they are physical fields. And uh, also the BRST invariant parts of the A, which are not BRST transformations of something else, they are also physical. Now physical, unphysical degrees of freedom in a Higgs theory change, because there the gauge boson has three physical degrees of freedom instead of two, because of its mass. And uh, some Higgs degree of freedom, namely the Goldstone degrees of freedom, they become unphysical. And therefore, this structure here must change. And indeed, it changes. And uh, so if you look at the linearized BRST transformations in a theory with Higgs mechanism, uh, then there are some additional non-zero terms, which means some additional Higgs fields become unphysical, and uh, vice versa. Yep. Uh, but it appears as the BRS transformation of something else. So it's also unphysical. Right, but it is uh, on the linear level, it is BRS invariant. But it's the BRS transformation of the photon, namely, uh, precisely speaking, the longitudinal part of the photon transforms into the ghost.
So it's part of this BRST quartet. Okay, very good result, and uh, that is what we can now apply. So I think that is, if I remember correctly, this is the last section of this chapter. I wanted to give you some examples and a sketch of the unitarity proof. Yeah, it's a little bit up to you how many examples we want to do. For sure I want to do the example which also is on the exercise sheet, namely for this MU nu relation to M for the glue-glue final state versus ghost anti-ghost final state. That is one example which is obviously important for the unitarity of the S matrix and I would like to derive the general slavnov taylor identity from that procedure. Uh, but we can also do another simpler example which connects to the Lorentz invariance uh, discussion from before that we had. So, yeah, I see you are already a little bit tired. And how much energy do you still want to invest into the lecture? I think you can do the exercise. Hmm. Can you confirm that then we will still do something in the exercise? Yes. The point is that is not for the video, but next week there is holiday, right? So therefore uh, it's nice to do this completely and then in two weeks from now we will start something new. But then today we will discuss everything that needs to be discussed on this topic. Okay, so one example for and by the way, you can also view uh, everything I say here and now uh, as part of the exercise because it really uh, could also be an exercise. But I will do it. So let us derive something for, for this green function. So uh, remember two weeks ago or some weeks ago anyway, we discussed this as one of those typical miraculous problems with miraculous solutions because if you calculate it, then you have here a Xi dependence of the propagator. And the question is, does the Xi gauge parameter drop out if you calculate the full S matrix element? And somehow it did drop out. How did it drop out? Who remembers it? It drops out because the Xi dependence appears um, is it possible that some of you explain how the Xi drops out? Somebody able to explain this? No? Okay, so what is the, it's like an exam question. So the answer could be the propagator depends on Xi, but the Xi dependence is only in the longitudinal parts of the propagator. Xi multiplies P mu P nu in the propagator. So then the uh, P mu term hits this line here. And then the question is what happens if you contract the entire line with the longitudinal photon momentum P mu? And there is a Watt identity or a slavnov taylor identity which tells us that if you contract the entire fermion line with the photon momentum P mu, you get zero. And that somehow corresponded to uh, current conservation. If you regard the entire line as a current, J mu, then you get in momentum space P mu times J mu equals zero, corresponding to the total derivative D mu J mu equals zero in position space. So current conservation or uh, the fact that uh, longitudinal momentum contracted with the current gives zero, that is the origin of the independence of Xi. Let us derive this from a slavnov taylor identity, okay? So this same um, relationship that the contraction of the line with P mu gives zero, that is a slavnov taylor identity. Previously I called it what identity in the QED case, but for QCD 
I call it Slavnov Taylor identity. So let us derive this. So what do we need to do? We use this. This identity, C bar, Psi, Psi bar, and take the BRST transformation of it and set it to zero. That is a Slavnov Taylor identity. Okay. So what happens? We get one term where we have the BRST transformation of the anti-ghost times Psi, Psi bar plus a term minus, because of Fermi statistics, C bar times BRS of Psi times Psi bar plus again C bar Psi uh, BRS of Psi bar. Okay, and so the sum of these combinations is zero. Now, um, we can look at the terms. Let's say this is term one, term two, term three. And let us do it in momentum space. In momentum space, let us assign some incoming momenta into all those field operators. Then which momenta should we assign? Let's say we assign the following incoming momenta. Uh, minus Q, then P, and minus P prime into these field operators. And then this is true for all the three green functions because, of course, we do a uniform Fourier transformation of the entire equation. So here, here, and here, the same momenta must be incoming. Good. Then let us discuss what, what this means. So for example, what is actually, uh, maybe let's start with the second. What is the result of the second green function at tree level? What is the tree level Feynman diagram corresponding to this green function? So in order to get the Feynman diagram, of course, you need to know what is the BRST transformation of Psi. And you know it because I just wrote it down a minute ago. This is minus i times gauge coupling times c times psi, so it is nonlinear. Therefore, we need Feynman diagrams uh, which are not ordinary green functions, but which correspond to diagrams where we have one special vertex, a two point vertex, where at one space time point there is a line attached for a ghost and a psi. Let's use this simple square for such special vertices corresponding to BRS transformations. Then we have here this vertex, and attached to that vertex is an incoming ghost line and an incoming fermion line. Because at this point, there is a field operator C and a field operator Psi. And uh, uh, in the Mathematical expression that would be multiplied with minus i times gauge coupling. And also, I neglect here the gauge group indices a, b, and so on, um, because they are not important for this calculation. Okay, so that corresponds to this vertex. And then we need otherwise an external c bar. So there must be an external point with a c bar, and there must be an external point with a Psi bar. How can a Feynman diagram look like which contains this vertex, this external point, and that external point? For example, like this. Now we have a Feynman diagram with an external C bar, an external Psi bar, and a special vertex where C and Psi are connected. And uh, so this would be a weak contraction between C and C bar, which is the ghost propagator. And here we have a weak contraction between Psi bar and Psi, which is the normal Dirac propagator. What is the value of this Feynman diagram in momentum space? The value, let's first write down the value of the special vertex minus i times g. 
And then in momentum space, we have here the rule for the ghost, which is I divided by the ghost momentum. What is the ghost momentum? So here into C bar, uh, sorry, into, what is it? Ah, we are here. So into C bar, there flows the momentum minus Q. So on this line, we have Q. Therefore, the ghost propagator is I over Q square. Then into Psi bar, there flows minus P slash. So on this line, in this direction, we have plus, uh, sorry, P prime. And then this line is I divided by P slash prime minus M, where M is the fermion mass. That's the value of this Feynman diagram. And the third Feynman diagram is similar. There you exchange the role of Psi and Psi bar, but it looks similar. But the fermion line goes into the opposite direction. What, however, is the result of the first term? The first term here has B, but B is now equal to minus 1 over Xi d mu a mu by using the equations of motion. Therefore, here we have a linear BRST transformation and therefore this is an ordinary green function. An ordinary green function, but multiplied with 1 over Xi and with a derivative in momentum space that is simply a product with a momentum. But otherwise it's a normal green function a normal green function with an external A, mu, an external psi, and an external psi bar. Now, how can a green function with a normal A mu, psi, and psi bar look like? Feynman diagram, for example, this one. with an ordinary vertex here for a Young-Mills theory, uh, gauge boson, fermion, anti-fermion vertex. It's a green function, not one particle irreducible, but a full green function. Therefore, the three external propagators are part of the green function. So what is the result of that green function? The result is, the, uh, and by the way, so one equal, so one contains minus 1 over Xi, minus 1 over Xi, times the momentum uh, and which momentum. So d mu becomes minus i times the incoming momentum. So in this case, d mu becomes plus i q mu times i q mu. So we have minus i q mu divided by Xi. And then we have the Feynman rule for this green function. So what is the Feynman rule for this green function? It is first of all the gauge boson propagator, which contains minus i over q square, then times the complicated thing, g mu nu minus q mu q nu divided by q square times 1 minus gauge parameter xi. Let's use the gauge parameter here for fun. Then we have the vertex. Uh, sorry, then we have, we have to go along the fermion arrow. So let's begin here. So then we have uh, the incoming momentum here into Psi is P. Therefore, we have here P going in that direction. And here we have P prime into the other direction. Therefore, we have I divided by P slash minus M times the vertex minus i g gamma um, nu, then i divided by p slash prime minus m. All right. Now,
what happens if we amputate the external legs and go on shell? So I give you 20 seconds to think about it. What happens with this Feynman diagram if you amputate the three external legs and go on shell? Or should we first do the last? line. If you remember what we discussed half an hour ago, um, you should see and know, even without calculation, what happens. What did I tell you half an hour ago? The conclusion of the previous blackboard. What would that mean for the diagram number two? But is that a linear or a nonlinear BRST transformation? Diagram two. Right. It should go to zero, right? Shouldn't it? Actually, it should go to zero, because that's what we stressed. Didn't we stress it? We stressed it, right? We stressed that only the linear BRST transformation survive. We derived it, actually, in general. Now, what happens if we go from the general to the concrete case? It should still remain true. What does it mean? You multiply with the three inverse propagators. Which three inverse propagators? For the three external lines. But there are not three external lines. Why not? Because of the nonlinear BRST transformation. <coughs> the th third external line is missing. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist because of that. This point here is that. And here you see exactly what I told you in general. You should have an external momentum PL. In this case, you should have an external momentum for Psi, which is called P. There should be an external momentum <coughs> P. But there is no line which carries the momentum P, because at the external point, the P is immediately distributed into two lines, one line with Q and one line with P prime, the sum of Q plus P is P. Q plus P prime is P. So P is distributed over two lines. But there is no single line which carries P, and therefore the diagram does not have a pole 1 over P square minus M square. Therefore, if we amputate, in other words, if we multiply with the three inverse propagators, we also multiply with P square minus M square, and then we set P square to M square, and then we get 0. That is the point. So we get zero. Okay. So we get zero because of p square minus m square goes to zero. And in the third diagram, it's vice versa. So p prime square wouldn't exist there. So, but that is exactly the example of the general case. So it's as simple as that. So we amputate all three external propagators for all three fields. And here there are just not three fields. That's the point. So the general statement is true here. And it means that two out of the three diagrams completely vanish. That is nice. So what about the third diagram? 
The third diagram is an ordinary green function and it came from a linear BRS transformation. And uh, therefore, it doesn't go to zero, it remains. And then we get an information from the slavnov taylor identity about this green function. And that information applies only if this green function has on-shell lines. Yep. Uh, good point. Um, we, in principle, have to multiply with the inverse propagator of the original anti-ghost field, uh, or in general terms, um, you would say, um, on this level, uh, with which inverse propagators we multiply, and we would decide here, in this case, we multiply with Q square times P square minus M square times P prime square minus M square, that is the least we should do. And uh, then maybe in order to be even more precise for the Dirac propagators, we could also divide by P slash plus M, and here divide it by P slash prime plus M. The denominator doesn't go to zero. But that is what we do. So we multiply here with a massless propagator. And um, actually, yeah. Uh, okay, I think that is enough. That is what we do. And then we see what happens. And then uh, that is what we discussed in the morning. So this uh, amputate on shell is maybe still a little bit uh, loosely defined. So we could now still decide for ourselves whether we on top of this multiply with wave functions u of p, u bar of p, or whether we do that later. But anyway, here we have an object which is not immediately an S matrix element, but which is very, very closely related to S matrix elements, and which can be very simply uh, transformed into an S matrix element by simple multiplication. Okay, so let's do it. So what happens here? What happens here, um, first of all, by doing this multiplication, um, we multiply with those inverse propagators, then this is cancelled. That is cancelled. And from the photon propagator, what happens? So with this Q mu, the transverse part of the photon propagator drops out. Only the longitudinal part of the photon propagator remains, which is the one proportional to xi. And uh, fortunately, exactly the xi drops out entirely because of the one over xi here. And therefore, uh, if we then amputate the photon propagator, simply xi cancels, q square cancels, and the additional 1 over q square is amputated, and so the whole object here goes to 1. And then what remains is just this here. So uh, minus i g gamma nu. And then, let's say, we multiply with speedors. So then we would get u bar of p, in this case, times u of p prime, in the other case. Uh, times q nu, times another q nu from here. So, and this is exactly nothing but q nu times J nu in the notation of our discussion. I think this was section 252 where we discussed the gauge independence of that process. And so there we also said that the gauge dependence drops out because if we multiply the fermion line, which we call J nu, with the photon momentum Q nu, it goes to zero. Yes? Zero, yes. But doesn't this mess up the, the result that it goes to one? Because we only... A Q squared drops out. Yes, but don't we multiply with it? What do you yeah, after we multiply with it, it drops out. But Before it doesn't drop out. It all comes because of the other one, we have Q mu, Q mu, and this one already cancels the Q squared in the denominator in front of the set. Q squared times Q squared. 
So let's say this is this is really the main part from the photon propagator. I would say so I would read it like this. This is really the essence of the photon propagator, and that will be amputated. Then this is kind of the numerator of the photon propagator, and if we multiply that with Q, then the transverse part drops out, and what remains is the longitudinal part, which is xi, times this. If we multiply this with Q, we get Q square over Q square drops out, and another Q remains, and the xi remains, and then we get this Q nu, and the xi drops out. So uh, this is the point. So we get from here, from this Lovnov Taylor identity that, let's write it here, we get this, which is graphically uh, this expression. If we take this fermion line on shell, including the spinos u bar and u, and contract with the incoming photon momentum, then we get zero. And so this shows you that uh, our observation that we made uh, in that section and also in the last semester, where we discussed the uh, xi independence of such processes, we derived explicitly that this relation holds from looking at the Feynman diagram. And now you see that this derivation is not an accident, but it follows from BRST invariance of the whole theory. By using Onchel's Lovnov Taylor identities, you discover that this is a special case of this whole general apparatus. And clearly, this identity is an all order identity, so you can derive now, if you want, uh, the same consequence at all orders. So, can now generalized to higher orders. Okay, and then I would say we are almost done. Just the last thing corresponding to the exercise. And also I want to say that I stressed many times whenever we had these uh, observations already in the last semester, I always said this follows from gauge invariance. Now you know why it follows and in what sense it follows from gauge invariance because gauge invariance was replaced by BRST invariance. BRST invariance implies Slavnov taylor identities and this is actually a special case of Slavnov taylor identities. That is the way in which it corresponds to gauge invariance. By the way, here in the linearized BRS transformations, you now see why they are relevant. They are relevant because they are the ones which do not drop out if you go on shell and amputate for S matrix elements. And these are exactly the ones from QED, right? Uh, that is essentially the ones, uh, uh, no, no, not, not from QD, but from that exercise sheet that we had already last semester, where we discussed exactly the linearized BRS transformations and we already made the analysis of Kuko Ojima and the QB operator and so on, and discussed the physical Hilbert space as a quotient space. So you see now that this emerges at all orders from the full Slavnov Taylor identities. So therefore you see that that analysis that we did at the time was not just a toy model for a free theory with no interactions, but is the thing which automatically comes out of the all order Slavnov Taylor identities if we look at S matrix elements. And therefore, as I already said, that analysis which looked like a simple tree level analysis is actually applicable to the uh, asymptotic theory of S matrix elements in the full theory. Okay. Good.
Okay, sorry, let's maybe hurry up a little bit more so that we can also do the exercises. What we have just done was um, an illustration of the Slavnov Taylor identity for gauge independence. And now let us look at an example relevant for unitarity of the S matrix corresponding to the exercise sheet. So we define a matrix element M mu nu, which is the green function psi psi bar A mu A nu, and we amputate and go on shell. That is exactly how this M mu nu was defined, except that in this case, indeed, we did not put the epsilon polarization vectors, but we did put the u and u bar spinors for those fields. That is how it was defined. But I do not write this in the notation. You know uh, what we mean by it. The Feynman diagrams corresponding to it are these ones. Three, three level Feynman diagrams, four quark antiquark going to gluon gluon in QCD with a triple gluon vertex, which is a non abelian diagram, and the other ones are similar to QED Feynman diagrams. Then we also define M, which is psi psi bar C C bar, amputated and on shell. And that corresponds just to one single Feynman diagram with ghost, anti-ghost in the final state. And this is also a purely non-abelian diagram because that vertex here has an FABC in it. So now your task was to calculate the three-level Feynman diagrams to the point where you see a certain slavnov taylor identity between the two Feynman diagrams, which again looks like a miracle or an accident, but actually we will see now that it follows, like in the previous case, from a general slavnov taylor identity in this amputated on-shell limit. So let's do that. The thing that you need to write down is this. So. Let's do exactly the BRS transformation, but one of the A's um, is first written as a C bar, and then we take the BRS transformation of that green function. I write down immediately the four terms. The first one is S psi, psi bar, A mu, and then C bar. The second term would be minus psi, S psi bar, A mu, C bar, then plus psi psi bar S A mu C bar, and plus psi psi bar A mu S C bar. Okay, so let's call them again one, two. three and four. And then you now have the experience you expect in the amputated on-shell limit. The first two should go to what? Zero. They should go to zero because they have nonlinear BRST transformations only. And um, okay, we might still check it maybe very briefly. So how does a Feynman diagram for this one or two look like, so a Feynman diagram for this would be, we get, again have this special vertex where, which corresponds to this BRS transformation, where we have here at the same point C and Psi. And then we need a diagram with an external Psi bar and an external A mu and an external C bar. How could such a Feynman diagram look like?
just to see. To see. To the to the thumb. Okay, very good. Like this. Is this the only Feynman diagram? No, it's not. For example, the A could also be connected to the CC bar line, uh, but that's all. These are the two three level Feynman diagrams, and then there would be higher order loop Feynman diagrams as well. Okay, but regardless, there are several Feynman diagrams, but clearly, again, uh, what happened before happens now as well. If we go on shell and amputate, then we would need to multiply with the inverse propagator for psi, which means we need here a pole in the momentum of psi. There is no pole in the momentum of psi because there is no line corresponding to psi alone. And so, uh, again, the momentum is distributed over these two lines, and therefore, if we go amputate and on shell, it goes to zero because there is no one over p psi square minus m square. So, the first two terms in the first line, they vanish. And in the last line, we have BRS T transformation of the gluon field that has a linear and a nonlinear term. And again, the nonlinear term drops out for the same reason. Maybe let's nevertheless illustrate it by a small Feynman diagram. Uh, the nonlinear term has the following structure. The nonlinear term for this is a product of ghost times A. So at one point, we would have a ghost and an A. And then we would need overall a Feynman diagram with external C bar. That is easy, here C bar, and an external Psi Psi bar, for example, like this. Okay. Then we have this Feynman diagram. And again, there is no pole corresponding to the momentum of A. Therefore, amputated on shell, it goes to zero. But there is now the diagram corresponding from the linear to, uh, to the linear BRST transformation, which is as follows. Here we have now the linear BRST transformation as linear of A mu is equal to d mu c. So that means at this point there is just a ghost field coming in, only a ghost. And then that will be multiplied with the momentum of the ghost in momentum space. But it's just a ghost field coming in. And then we need an external c bar, an external psi psi bar. So how can it look like? So this is now really nothing different from having an external ghost. Here we have an external anti-ghost, here we have an external ghost, here we have an external psi psi bar. Where have you already seen something with an external ghost, anti-ghost, psi psi bar? Have you already seen such a thing, C, C bar, psi psi bar? Maybe here. That. Okay, that's what you wanted to say, I guess. So like this. Okay, it looks a bit, little bit weird, but it's the same Feynman diagram. Okay, so this is our uh, term three. Our term three, therefore, contains this Feynman diagram 
but with a small modification, namely multiplied with the ghost momentum. That is exactly what appears in the slavnov taylor identity. K mu times m. Now diagram four. Diagram four is this one here, where sc bar is minus one over xi d mu a mu. So long story short, this is already a linear BRST transformation. Um, and we directly get a green function, psi psi bar a a, which is this green function here, but one a is multiplied with a momentum and times one over xi. So, times one uh, a is multiplied with a momentum, let's say minus one over xi times minus i times p into a nu. Now, what happens if you amputate and go on shell? I think we can uh, immediately write down the result, which is now hopefully obvious. The first two terms go to zero. The third term goes to one of, I mean, you know what is the expected result. It's the one from your exercise sheet, namely uh, m times one momentum is equal to m u nu times the other momentum. And that is exactly what we get here. Let's just check the i's and the signs and so on um, by looking at it. So here you get um, the green function with cc bar. Uh, amputated on shell just does the obvious thing and then we multiply with minus i times the momentum which flows from the inside into the ghost field. Here we get uh, also exactly the expected mu nu times one over xi times i p a. Um, this is the other momentum, exactly like in the slavnov taylor identity that we expect, also times minus i, but also times another minus. And now something happens if we amputate it's a little bit complicated because the photon propagate or gluon propagator that we have to amputate is now important. It is of course matrix valued. So it contains a longitudinal part and the transverse part. And we need to amputate the entire propagator, but only the longitudinal part matters because of this. The transverse part drops out entirely. The longitudinal part matters. But the longitudinal uh, gluon propagator is proportional to xi. If we amputate it, then the one over xi here drops out. And therefore, we get uh, just the amputated result without one over xi times the momentum. And then we get this desired relation, namely k1 mu times m mu nu is equal to k2 nu times m as in the exercise. And again, here you see that this uh, observation that you can make from calculating explicit diagrams and which is important for fundamental physics properties is actually a consequence of a more general slavnov taylor identity. And also here, of course, you can go on and derive the same thing at arbitrarily high orders. So, and then I can just briefly sketch the unitarity proof. which is simply the following. You can d 
define a QB operator acting on asymptotic uh, states and asymptotic fields such that the commutator of QB with a field gives the linearized BRS transformation of the field times some transformation parameter theta as before. And uh, the BRS transformation contains only the linearized ones and therefore this acts exactly in the same way as the QB that we looked at already before and in the exercise sheet from last year. And uh, then using the slavnov taylor identity uh, amputated and on shell proves the following. It simply proves that this QB commutes with the S operator. That's really the essence of all these relationships here. This is basically uh, the same statement or the specialized statement of the general fact that this QB commutes with the S operator. And then we know this QB is Lorentz invariant. The original S operator is Lorentz invariant. And so then you can define a physical Hilbert space as the quotient space. And because of the commutation relation that S commutes with QB, you can say that S restricted onto uh, the physical Hilbert space um, is well defined, first of all. So if you are in one equivalence class, you are mapped into one unambiguous equivalence class, so the equivalence structure is retained and it is um, unitary. Again, because of the commutation relation. And that's it. Then in this way you can prove the unitarity of the S-matrix and you just have to fill in some details which uh, basically work similarly to this, just um, generalized. And that, my friends, ends our discussion of quantized Young Mills series. Let me just give you the reference where this is done exactly in this way is Kuko Ojima. But already uh, all the other people that I mentioned in the morning, Toft, uh, Zinchester, uh, BRST, they all also did unitarity proofs. They did not yet use exactly this language, but they did equivalent um, manipulations. But this is probably the most elegant formulation of the unitarity proof where you see an elegant structure emerging from the slavnov taylor identities. Okay, uh, what I didn't discuss now is the gauge independence of the S matrix such that the Xi parameter also drops out. That is a little bit different, so you need to extend uh, in the most elegant approach, you extend the slavnov taylor identity such that the slavnov taylor identity also tells you what is the Xi dependence of various quantities. But um, let us not discuss it in detail. You can find it in the references. But the basic logic is now always the same. Slavnov Taylor identities go on shell, amputate in order to extract physical information. And the off shell Slavnov Taylor identities are important for renormalization. Very good. That is the structure. And um, 
The physics of the theories and of the BRST formalism is now really contained in the linearized form, which is very simple. And as I said, this uh, will change in an interesting way if we go to the electroweak theory. But also there, then uh, historically, it was of course very important to prove those properties of unitarity. There it was maybe even more important uh, because it was even less obvious and you might know that you need the Higgs boson to make the theory unitary and so on. So that was a big discussion also historically. But one can prove it using identical methods. All right, then the chapter is done and we can close the lecture and come to the exercise. <laughs>